uh, let's get started. Um, uh, bear with me as I uh, figure out exactly how to do this. Um, so let's see, looks like we're going strong here. Okay, looking good. Uh, I'm going to start. If there's any technical problem or anything, please send me a chat uh, so that I can fix it. Um, okay, so I'm Heather Meeker, and uh, I'm sure I've met a few of you before. Uh, if we were in a live room, I'd be able to figure that out better. Um, I'm going to talk today about how to turn an open source project into a business. And um, just a little bit about me to begin with. Uh, I'm a lawyer and a venture capitalist, and I have been specializing heavily in open source software for quite a few years now, maybe longer than it's been cool. And uh, so I'm here to sh share some thoughts with you today. If you're interested in turning your project into a business, how you might go about that. So we're going to talk about licensing and business models and uh, so forth. So. Here we go. Okay, so we all know that open source can be a labor of love, and that's great. You know, there are a lot of projects that are community projects that are never, uh, you know, intended to be commercial at all, and that's fine. Um, this uh, presentation isn't to suggest that the only thing that you should do is make a business out of open source, but to provide you with some structure and guidance about how to do it if you're interested in doing that because uh, lots of people want to make a business out of the things they love. Uh, so let's talk about how that happens. So open source these days is not only business, it's big business. And um, I'd like to point out that actually, you know, I wrote an article a while ago. Uh, it was actually before all of this uh, unfortunate uh, pandemic stuff hit. Um, it was about a year ago, about how most of the big open source businesses were actually started during down economies. And there are a lot of reasons for that that I won't get into uh, because of our time constraints. But um, actually, times like these that are difficult tend to produce a lot of really interesting open source projects that become big businesses. So uh, it's perhaps a message of hope here that people who are stuck at home writing software right now, I like to think that they're coming up with a big game changer as we speak here. So let's see what happens in a year or two when these companies sort of come out into the open. Uh, to prove my point that open source is big business, this is a, an index that's maintained by uh, Joseph Jacks, who is my partner in um, open source software capital. And you can take a look at it if you like, uh, but it looks at some of the biggest open source companies and gives some interesting thoughts about it, including roughly what their business model is. But it's a very impressive list, and it uh, includes a lot of companies that have had, um, you know, rather spectacular exits. So, you know, once upon a time, um, <clears throat> people used to ask me, how can you really, can you really make money doing this? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, there's no question about that at this point in time. It's just a question of how you're going to go about it. And that's the index, which you can look at uh, online if you like later. Very interesting. Okay, so to turn your project into a, a, a business from project to profit, there are a few things you need to think about, and we're going to talk about those today. So the first and more, most important thing is to understand what your business model is. And we'll talk a lot about different business models um, that you might want to consider. The next thing that you need to do is you need to take care of your branding, and you need to take care of it early and often. It's almost one of the first things you should do. We'll talk about that a little bit, but if there's one thing that I uh, like bit of advice that I give people who are starting open source businesses that I think tends to help them a lot, it's to pay attention to branding from day one. And then I'll give a few tips, which are not exactly legal advice, but sort of general commercial, you know, kind of straddles legal and business advice about getting your project ready for prime time in order to release it. Okay, we're going to talk first about business models. 
Okay, so my first piece of advice is don't be the underpants gnomes. Now, to understand this meme, you have to be a, um, a South Park fan. And I understand that now I'm dating myself by using this meme at all. But the underpants gnomes were uh, these little creatures who went around and stole underpants from people. And when they were asked why, they said, well, we have a, you know, a, a business plan. Phase one, collect underpants. Phase two, question mark. Phase three, profit. So you need to understand what's in that question mark. Uh, here, phase one would be having an open source project and phase three is profit. And we need to talk about how to get from A to B because if you want to run you know, a, a healthy company and maybe you want some investors, you're going to have to explain the question mark. So now we're going to talk about that. Okay, so... In every, every open source business model is to some extent what I would call a razor blades model. So this is another meme much older <laughs> than me even. Um, you know, it came at least uh, theoretically from King Gillette who started the Gillette Razor Company. And what he said was, uh, give them the razors and sell them the blades. So in any kind of business model that involves giving something away, you have to be selling something. If you're not selling something, you don't have a business. You may have a labor of love, but you won't have a business. So the main thing about open source businesses is to figure out exactly what you're selling. And there are a lot of different approaches that businesses have used. All of them have been used successfully. So the first and most obvious is maintenance and support. And I'm gonna tell you in a moment that I think this pure model doesn't really exist, but I will explain why. So the, the idea is you have an open source project so people can use the software freely for anything they like, and then you offer maintenance and support. And theoretically, they come to you because you're the one who knows the most about the software. So this business model certainly works. The thing is about maintenance and support is that it's a human resources heavy business model and it requires people with lots of skill. And that's all great, but it's what we say not scalable <laughs> in the uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, because in order for a business to scale, you need some kind of product and pure hu human resource type services are very hard to scale and make uh, high profits on. So if you're trying to get people invested to invest in a business, you have to show them what the return uh, uh, philosophy is. Now, I'm a lawyer for the most part, and so I'm intimately familiar with the fact that human resources businesses don't scale. That's well, exactly the problem that accountants and lawyers and consultants have. Uh, you can make a business out of it, but it tends to be very bounded by the number of hours people have in a day that they're willing to work. So um, while this is an obvious model, it's not how most of the, the really successful companies make money. This is more like providing a job for you, which if you're the starting the open source project, which by the way is fine. It says if you want to kind of take it to the next level, you have to go beyond maintenance and support. And by the way, um, you know, people tend to use these terms together but technically maintenance is updates and so forth. And support is the human interaction of helping people to do things. So maintenance in an open source project is really free to anybody, right? Nobody has to pay for that because you're releasing new you know, updates to the general public and anybody can use them. So this is really a model about support. And that's why I say it's not scalable. Okay, but now I'm gonna say that the companies you think of that are running a maintenance and support model are really selling you something else. And what they're selling you is quality assurance. Okay, so my picture here is the pet rock, which also dates me. This is a fad, I think in the 70s or 80s. And it's uh, basically they put some eyes on a rock and put it in a box with a nice logo and sold it. And it was hugely popular, a big fad. So. What's the difference between the rock and the pet rock? Well, somebody is applying their like branding and their quality control to it because I guess, you know, you wouldn't get a rock with jagged edges or something like that, right? So what people are doing here, you know, uh, analogizing to the open source situation is they're saying, here's my product. 
and it has my brand on it. And that means it's a product you want. Okay. So branding and quality insurance go quality assurance go hand in hand. Okay. So here's the thing. People don't buy source code. Customers buy products. And that means a product that's been built and has a certain reputation that it's going to be maintained over time and so forth. So when you look at the really big companies that are basically um, deploying a maintenance and support model, like say Red Hat, which had an enormous exit, really what they're selling in a sense is quality control. And their brand means a lot. People buy Red Hat software because it's Red Hat software. And they're not paying for licenses, but on a certain level, IT managers don't care. You know, they're buying something that will work for them to solve a problem. And that's not intellectual property or copyright licenses. That's an actual product. So if you're going for kind of the most basic model, you're really selling a quality assurance to people. Now, this is a hard model to deploy. And the conventional wisdom is that, quote unquote, there's only one red hat. And the reason people say that you know, a lot when they're talking about open source businesses is that Red Hat had a huge project behind it, like the biggest, most valuable open source project in the world. And so they had a huge marketplace. And so they could uh, they could um, benefit from economies of scale. OK, so that's one model. The next model I'm going to suggest to you is online services. This model has typically worked really well in the small to medium enterprise area. So think about WordPress. The WordPress is a great product. WordPress.com, which is, by the way, where I run my own personal sort of website and blog, is basically online services. And it's there for lazy people like me who don't want to run their own website. Right? Um, so um, that works great. Uh, but it sometimes tends to work better for people who don't have their own IT system. So the sales tend to be high volume, low price sales. Now, the uh, exception that proves that rule is GitHub, uh, which is essentially online services for the Git project. Uh, but GitHub, uh, you know, very smartly um, created a platform where everyone wanted to be because they were sort of an, a, a, an early market entrant and they provided a lot of extra bells and whistles and, and uh, uh, shall we say, a conservation of the, uh, of the online platform and community. So that's the online services model. You're using an open source piece of software, which may be made available. I like the comments about Pet Rock in the in the chat, by the way. Um, uh, they, uh, they, they provide services surrounding the software, but theoretically, anyone could run their own instance of it. Okay, next is professional services. And again, this is a model that doesn't scale very well because it's human resource heavy. And there aren't a ton of you know, businesses that you would recognize today that are doing this and making lots of money in the open source space. Um, one that I remember was a company called Monta Vista, which uh, did custom Linux systems, mostly for embedded. And there are certainly people still doing that, but they don't tend to be big companies. They tend to be small developers. So professional services around open source, doing customizations, maybe custom features, uh, that is definitely a business model, but it has scaling issues. The next um, is sometimes called widget frosting. <laughs> it's a, a cute term. But what that means is that you're taking the open source software and you're using it to sell custom hardware. So an example of this might be uh, like uh, uh, the Kindle. It might be uh, the, the Digium uh, uh, telecom platform and so forth. What you're doing is you're saying, I'm giving away the software, I'm going to sell you the hardware. And the limitation of this model is that hardware sales have low margins. So you have to have high volume. Uh, but it's definitely a business model that can work. And by the way, there are tons of companies who release open source software in order to get you to use their custom hardware products. That's all over the place. 
you know, almost every IoT device, right? Then here's an interesting one that most people don't think of, and I call it the embargo model. So what happens here is that you have an open source project, but you give early access to people who are paying for it. What that means is that you're doing a custom proprietary software agreement with your best customers, and they get a first look at new features. Now, this works well in markets where a, uh, you know, a small uh, entry advantage is huge. For instance, consumer electronics, which, you know, have a half-life of about 15 seconds before you have to buy a new one, right? So if you're doing software for, say, uh, smartphones, you're doing software for some kind of uh, consumer electronic device, then you can provide your customers with a lot of value just by giving them early access. And then later on, you give the community access. So this is sort of a staged release model. And by the way, a lot of companies do this and really don't make much hay about it, but that's how they're sort of eking the, the business benefit out of the open source model. Uh, the next is dual licensing. And uh, the, the pictures here, <laughs> um, the first picture of the really cute little babies is um, representing when you have dual licensing where the products are identical, but the licenses are different. So this model was pioneered by MySQL. Um, and basically it's saying, here's a software, and it's usually under something like GPL or AGPL, a very like strong copyleft license. And, uh, and we'll give this to you for free under the open source license. And if you don't want to abide by the conditions in that license, you can pay us for an exception. So that's what I would call classic dual licensing. And then there is a variation on that, which is sometimes called open core or upsell or lots of other things. We're going to talk about that in a bit. But the picture there is of fraternal twins. So they're almost the same, but they're not quite the same. And one is going to be the commercial, uh, the commercial or enterprise version and the other is going to be the open source version. And typically when uh, companies do this, they, um, they put the features in the commercial version that are of most use to the biggest customers. So essentially what they're saying is, here's the community version and maybe small to medium enterprises or individuals will use that. But if you wanna deploy this at scale, we're going to provide proprietary upsell for you to do this. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about open core. And the reason I'm doing that is that if you look back at our like Kosky index that I started with, um, you'll see that many of the most successful companies deploy this particular business model. So in open core, you've got a core that is true open source under an open source license. And then you've got add-ons that are under other kinds of licenses. Uh, so there are tons of examples of this. Um, and, uh, and some of the most uh, you know, well-known ones um, are Confluent, Redis, Elastic. Uh, those are not coincidentally all in the sort of middleware or database space. Um, and, uh, and there have been lots of examples of this over the years. But what you do in this model, it's a fraternal twins model. So you say the core is an open source project and you may or may not as a company even run that project. But what you do is you develop the enterprise features for the product and then you're the experts in deploying that in the enterprise. And when you sell it to the enterprise, you're essentially licensing it under a proprietary license, providing maintenance and support and all the other things that one would expect from an open source, uh, uh, from a, a, a business model, okay? So that's open core where you have, um, oh good, you can, I think you can see my uh, cursor moving. So you've got the OSS core. And by the way, these days, Almost all of them are under Apache 2 because that's become such a, a popular license, particularly for corporate use. And then the add-ons are under other kinds of licenses. And 
those licenses can actually vary quite a bit. Um, I see a comment here, Magento is like that. Enterprise Edition is uh, community plus proprietary add-ons. Yeah, Magento, I believe, is one of the uh, companies on the Kosky Index. Um, isn't Red Hat, well, that's a, the question is, isn't Red Hat like this as well? I, I think you might get some controversy over that, and I won't speak for Red Hat, but I believe Red Hat doesn't have any proprietary features, um, but they do uh, have, uh, you know, a, like maintenance support quality control. And also they have their own builds that they sell, and that lies somewhere in between software and services, right? Uh, but they're not doing the open core upsell the way a lot of the other companies are. I'm just going to uh, uh, answer a couple of the comments here. Um, let's see, at what point it changes from open source software that you can use free to product you use to make a profit? Well, so that depends on where you're going to set the line between these things. So let's talk a little bit about more about how you do this. And I'm pausing a long time on this open course slide because this is what most people want to do in business these days, although there are all those other models. So if you want to deploy a business like this, you have to figure out what the dividing line is between your open core and your proprietary upsell models. And also, um, there may be more, more than two buckets. So what we've uh, what I've demonstrated on this slide in a very simplistic way is essentially a two bucket model. So you've got your core under Apache 2, say, and you've got your add-ons under your proprietary license. And because you are the developer, at least of the add-ons, you get to decide where this dividing line is. So you have to make a decision about what people will buy. And so you'll get money for it. and therefore that will be the maximum uh, um, uh, benefit to your business. Whereas for the core, which is open source, that's where you're going to get community support, get people contributing to the project. And so that will also have a benefit to your business, but you're not gonna get money for licensing it. You might get money for maintenance and support and so forth, but uh, not money for license it. So the trick to deploying the open core model is figuring out which of the parts should be free and community supported and which parts are your business. Um, okay, um, uh, I'm gonna uh, look, oops, went the wrong way. Okay, I'm gonna go back here. Um, I'm going to answer a question uh, or read a couple of the, the comments. Um, the biggest drawback to open core is that it signals to open source users what features won't be available to them. I tend to avoid it as a com consumer. And I think that's an interesting comment and it, and it points up how much art there is to deploying a model like this because you don't want to alienate your, uh, your community by putting too many things in the upsell uh, buckets, right? You really want the upsell buckets only to be for the, the, the software that is going to be for people who don't want, want to buy it and don't want to do it themselves, right? And so the corollary to that is you need to understand your market, right? So if you don't understand the market and who's likely to buy and who's not likely to buy, See, your customers are making a build by decision and they're going to make that based on the license terms and also how much effort it will be to deploy things themselves. So you have to figure out where to draw that line in order not to alienate your community. I see another comment that says both ends of open source licenses are booming, uh, copyleft and not copyleft with, with respect to Apache 2 and AGPL. And that's true, but... Um, the clients that I work with and the businesses that I work with these days, they're overwhelmingly choosing a, uh, uh, Apache 2 as their core um, because, uh, oops, I'm sorry, wait, I'll go back here. Uh, wait, sorry about that. And that behind the wheel. Okay, so... Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I'm seeing mostly Apache, but the reason for that is that one of the uh, philosophies of um, deploying an open core model is that your open source element, whatever it is, the core, you want massive adoption of that very quickly. And it's easier to accomplish that with a permissive license than it is with a license like AGPL. AGPL will do more to forestall competition. It's an imperfect way to do that, by the way. And that's kind of another subject from this talk. But the point is that people are overwhelmingly choosing the permissive licenses because they are so easy to get people to adopt. Um, OK, so I'm going to move on here. Um, I'm going to mention a project that I uh, was involved in. And I'm not going to go into this a lot because this is a whole another hour of talk, right? But um, if you were looking at what happened in late 2008 and early 2000, uh, I'm sorry, late 2018, early 2019, uh, a lot of companies that were open core model were sort of rebalancing their portfolio, so to speak, and, take, and taking some of the code and maybe from open source to their uh, proprietary buckets and, and vice versa, right? And when that happened, a, a kind of license started becoming very popular, which I would call source available. There's not really a great word for what it is, but it's not open source because although it makes source code available, it, is, um, it has license restrictions. And once that happened, I actually started this project to write some standardized licenses. And the reason I did that is because I love standardization. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan. And one of the great things about open source is it is standardized. I mean, even setting aside, you know, the fact that it's really great that it, you know, grants you all these rights and freedoms and so forth. It's standardized and that makes that that makes it easy for adopters to understand it. So I started this project in order to give little open core companies a way to adopt a standard license. So if you're looking at deploying an open core model, you want to you might want to take a look at this project. And if you have more questions about it, feel free to reach out to me. Um, so the way that this would work, for instance, is that the core is Apache. And then the add-ons, instead of being full on proprietary or just SaaS, are some source available license. And I suggested here non-commercial, which is essentially a license that says, Here's the software, you can use it for all non-commercial purposes. And this forestalls a fair amount of competition, but not all competition. And so this is a way to get out the door quickly with an open core model. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to uh, branding. And by the way, I'm gonna reserve a little bit of time at the end for questions, uh, so uh, hope there will be some. So if you have questions that uh, that you want to make sure get answered, uh, feel free to uh, save them up until then. Or uh, I'll, I'll try to I'll try to just uh, follow the, the comments as it goes on. Um, so let's talk about branding. So I told you that branding is the most one of the most important things that you have to attend to to deploy an open source business. So let's talk about some of the businesses we love here and what they're doing with branding. So here you've got the support and quality control type business. And you'll see that these brands are, you know, extremely well-known brands. You've got the open core model, which I just give Confluent as an example of it. And then you've got the cloud services model, which is, um, uh, you know, you've got, uh, Cloudera and Hadoop, and you've got Git and GitHub there. So um, all of these companies, one thing that they did well in deploying their business models was that they paid attention to branding from the get-go. And what I'd like to point out to you about this is that the brand for Red Hat is different from Fedora, which is their open source project. And the brand for Confluent is different from Kafka, which is their open source core. And the brand for Cloudera, which is built around Hadoop, is entirely different. And the brand for GitHub, which is built around Git, well, those are kind of similar, but uh, they 
the, but you probably don't think of them as entirely the same thing. So what I wanted to demonstrate to you here is that the businesses who are doing a really good job on branding are creating a separate brand for their commercial offering different from the open source that is the basis for their business. And while this can be a kind of a hard sell in the marketplace, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's a very good thing to do. So if you're thinking of deploying an open source business, it's much better to start out thinking about how you are going to differentiate your commercial project product from your open source, the core of your business, and to go in fairly different directions with them. Um, if you call your business some variation of the open source core, like Git and GitHub, that's doable, but at the end of the day, you're going to have a lot more business advantage with a separate brand. And so I highly recommend that people think about this when they're starting an open source uh, business. Pablo, I see your question for the end and I will uh, answer it um, uh, when I get to the end of my prepared, uh, more or less prepared remarks. Thank you. Okay, now I'm gonna talk for a couple of minutes about getting ready for prime time. So what I mean by this is that when you're going to release a project that's gonna form the basis of a business, there are a few things that you ought to think about. And some of these are going to be painfully obvious to you. Um, I think most of the people who are attending here are developers, but when I talk to in-house lawyers and sort of CEOs and so forth who are not technologists, they typically don't know about this stuff. And so um, I like to say this so that people have a kind of checklist for getting ready to, you know, to put your best foot forward when you do your open source release. Okay, so um, when you release an open source project, there is a tendency, and it's not wrong, to just get the code out there and get people interested in it. And that's all well and good. But when you are going to use your open source project as a basis for a serious business, you need good documentation. And, you know, uh, I used to be a programmer and I know that doc documentation is never good because there's never enough time to create all of it. But um, you really need to take a look at how professional your documentation looks. Uh, make sure that you've got documentation that is for both users and developers and uh, and make sure that it looks professional, you know, um, you know, put it through the spell checker and everything. So if you want to uh, release a project and have it be like taken seriously from business point of view by your customers who are thinking of adopting it or even playing around with it when you first release it, it's best to have some good documentation. So Take the time to write that and, uh, and pay attention to it because it matters. Um, next, you may have seen there was, uh, you know, there's been a fair amount of news lately about codes of conduct in um, open source projects. And uh, I won't go into all the gory details about that. Um, if you're interested in this topic, there's some stuff on my blog about it and plenty of other places too. But, you know, these days, a professional open source project has a code of conduct. And, you know, the codes of conduct basically say, you know, be respectful of each other. And, and, and then they say something about how um, complaints are going to be handled. And that's so you do not want to go down the route that some of the open source projects have gone down, having, you know, people get alienated, you know, start a, a Twitter war and so forth about how they're treated when they try to uh, contribute to a project. If you want your project to be taken seriously by business, then you have to pay attention to the culture of business. And these days, the, the, the culture of business requires this kind of sort of professional interaction. The, the days of, uh, I wouldn't say that the days of kind of the incredibly blunt, uh, benevolent dictator for life are over, but, if you want your open source project to be business, then you have to treat it like business and code of conduct is one of the ways to do that. By the way, if you want to just grab a code of conduct, 
take a look at the one that Mozilla promulgates. It's a pretty good one. And um, that's just an example. There are plenty of uh, different examples out there and plenty of different styles. But consider posting a code of conduct in your GitHub repository from day one. Um, the next thing you have to figure out is your contribution licenses. And again, this is a completely separate topic. But when you release an open source project and you apply a license to it, like Apache or like AGPL, um, what you're doing is you're saying what license terms are, uh, what license rights are flowing from the project out to the world. So we call that an outbound license. But when people give you code as a contribution, you have to figure out what the inbound license is. And there are essentially a couple of ways of doing that. One is by using what's called license in equals license out. And that's very popular with some projects. For instance, the Linux kernel is like that. Everybody who contributes is contributing under GPL2, which is the outbound license as well. They actually use something called the Developer Cert uh, Certificate of Originality, which is not a license, but it's sort of a guarantee that the person actually wrote what they are uh, contributing. Um, but that's the license in equals license out model. And by the way, if you run a project on GitHub, the GitHub terms actually say that if you don't say otherwise, and this is in the terms of use that apply to contributors, if you don't say otherwise, then the uh, contribution will be under the outbound license. Um, however, there are some projects, particularly ones that run corporate projects that run under something like AGPL or GPL, and they actually use what's called a contribution license. And what that means is that your contributors are giving you a broad, unrestricted license to use whatever they contribute. So why, why, why might you need to use that? Well, if the contributors are contributing to the proprietary bits of your open core model, you need to actually clear those rights. So you need to decide how this is going to work for your project. And there are lots of roads you could go down here. You can use either scheme that I described. And also you can, uh, for instance, not take contributions to your proprietary pieces if you're running open core. But you gotta figure that out, uh, maybe not on the day you launch, but you have to figure it out before you take your first contributions from the community. So it needs to be done early on. And that's probably a conversation with a lawyer, unfortunately. <laughs> so um, need to figure that out and deploy it um, in your uh, open source launch. And then also, and this is also something that you might get away with not doing on day one, but governance and succession planning are really important. If you want your customers to take seriously the fact that you're offering a commercial prod product, you need to make sure that the project does not go away when the person who started it uh, either moves on to another sphere or you know retires or whatever. Uh, so having some succession planning is one of the elements that will give customers confidence that your project is going to be supported going forward. And of course, customers not only want that on a business level, but they want to make sure that you're going to keep the product secure going forward. So you have to have some kind of sustainable model to keep it going. And if that is a corporation that has investors and stockholders and so forth, Great, but you need to make sure that that your open source project is not sort of a cult of personality that is um, dependent on a single person paying attention to it. Um, okay, uh, so those are some suggestions about things to think about to make your project sort of ready for prime time on a business level. Um, I'm, I'm going to answer a few of the questions. We have about five minutes left. Uh, and I see one. It says, you said AGPL3 is an imperfect way to forestall con con uh, competition. I'd like you to elaborate that. Also, why you assumed a AGPL3 would be chosen for that purpose. OK, so um, I'll try to make this kind of the short version because it's potentially a long topic. But um, 
A Faro GPL was created because of the so-called, uh, you know, SAS loophole in GPL. So if you put, uh, well, let, let me start over again. If you go back in time about 20 years, um, most software was distributed if it was in a commercial pro product. And so if you put software out under GPL, you would make it difficult to impossible for somebody to incorporate that into a commercial project product and sell it because they would probably be distributing software. As software moved to the cloud, uh, there was something that was called the SaaS loophole or a few other names. And the thing is that the obligations of the conditions of GPL to share source code don't kick in until you distribute the software. And so more and more people were offering software as a service. And when they did that, they weren't distributing the software. And so they weren't obligated to abide by the conditions of GPL. So the, um, the Free Software Foundation, um, when, it, when it moved to GPL version three, made an alternate version called a Faro GPL. And it was called that for historical reasons um, because there was a product called a Faro that had a similar license. And a Faro GPL treats uh, SaaS use sort of like distribution in the sense that if you use a software for SaaS use and you modify it, you have to make the source code available to users. So that was typically considered at that point the best license for a dual licensing model because it was seen as, um, as, uh, as uh, discouraging people from using the software in commercial settings. Then what happened was that people would start using the software for SaaS but when they were creating sort of extra bells and whistles for it to sell, one moment, please. They would actually create those bells and whistles outside the scope of the program that was covered by AGPL. And so you saw a bunch of really big um, uh, cloud services providers. When you see people talk about this in the news, they're always talking about Amazon, but it's not the only example all of the big cloud services providers were using a bunch of open source software and they were making lots of money from it and not really sharing anything back with the developers. And so that was the issue that arose in late 2018. And you saw a bunch of the companies that were in the database and middleware space saying AGPL isn't enough to keep us healthy as a going concern because all these companies are using our stuff without paying us. So that was the essential issue with AGPL and why uh, you know, it was very popular as a dual licensing model for a while, but it has become less popular over time. Um, another question, we have a couple minutes left. Uh, George, hi George, <laughs> nice to see you on here. Um, what factors would you consider in determining if a project is suitable for profit making? Number of downloads, contributions, et cetera. Well, that's a really good question. Is downloads don't really equate to sales. They're maybe an indicator, but they're not a sufficient condition for sales. So I would say that's really the difference between sort of the question mark for the underpants nims, right? Lots of downloads are great. But that doesn't mean people are going to pay you for your software. And so in order to figure out whether it makes sense to make a business out of an open source project, um, you have to figure out what you're going to be selling for people to pay you. And uh, it's going to depend on what, the, what your average customer is going to look like, big, small, what are they doing with the software. It's going to depend on what, the, uh, you, know, what you think your profit margin is how many other kinds of services you can sell in a bundle like SaaS and maintenance and support and so forth. And so sorry to give a Nambi Pambi answer here, but there are a lot of factors, but downloads is a good indicator of a potential project for a business, but it's not a sufficient condition. It's really a separate analysis to figure out whether it works as a business. Um, I got one more minute. Um, I see, uh, a question from, um, let's see, 
uh, from Nathaniel. Are there specific gotchas or considerations for building business around another org's open source project? GitHub for Git, Cloudera for Hadoop, et cetera. Yes, the main thing you got to figure out there, well, two things, I think. First is branding. If someone else is running the project, you can't use their brand. And so you really need to put a lot of effort into establishing your own brand. So that's super important. The other thing is that you, you're much, you're probably much better off being a robust part of that project than you are forking it. And so you need to make sure that you're keeping up excellent relations with that project and that, um, you know, you won't go your separate ways because that won't be good for probably either of you. Um, so I, I see we're at the end of the session. I thank everybody for attending. This was a lot of fun. And uh, thanks for all the wonderful questions and comments. Uh, that was that was really great to see all of the interaction there. And if um, here, by the way, on this slide is uh, information about my book. You can get a free copy by going to my website and following the instru instructions there. Uh, and I'm the easiest person on world to, in the world to find. So if you have any follow-up questions, please reach out. I'm happy. This is my favorite topic. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the sessions today and uh, stay safe and healthy, okay?